My name is Colin, and I am a racial profiler. <laughs> when the Enron scandal broke, I thought to myself, this is going to be older white guys in business suits. <laughs> when there's a shooting outside a hip-hop club, I think this is going to be young black guys in rock -Aware. <laughs> Does this make me a racist or a person living in reality? Oh, now listen, racial profiling, obviously it's a touchy subject, but at the same time, don't we all profile people? I mean, if I didn't know you four, I would profile you, you know what I mean? You, I would uh, think, was like the guy that everyone pictured before they arrested the guy that really kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. <laughs> you know, they look like you, you know? Uh, Bonnie, you know, you're like the pretty girl, and so you say, oh, she's too pretty to me. If I didn't know you weren't banging me, I'd say, she must be banging me. <laughs> And I don't appreciate that. And Greg, I wouldn't, think, I wouldn't think you're more Eastern European than Latino, except for that big medallion around your neck. And uh, that brings out the Puerto Rican and all of you. And uh, Robinson, you know how I feel. You look, like, you look like the cool black guy in the unhip white town. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, he lives, with, <laughs> he lives with some big white girl. She loves to get a giant ride. She goes to work. He's, always, he's like a half a bass player. You know, sometimes he gets to get a little jazz session. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you guys profile me for what I am. It must be hard because you know me as a legend and a star, so I know you can't just profile me. <laughs> well, what do you think of profiling? Bad? Good? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Were you going to slam me? No, I wasn't going to slam you. I just figured you'd be a middle-aged, nervous man. That's what I think you are. Oh, that hurts. Yes. <laughs> a finished Irish idiot with his last shot in the show business. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's very interesting. Well, um... I'm profiling, right? Yes, that's profiling, the, uh, Bonnie. Thank you, Canadian. Yeah, the Arabs at the airport, that's the, uh, that's the deal. And, uh, Arabs at the airport, sure. Sure, they, uh, they profile us, right? You ever try to get a cab on a Saturday night? Yeah. Those cabs pick and choose, man. They really do. Yeah. Why so does a white you girl have trouble getting a cab? Well, I don't, but I was thinking oh, of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to be hot to get a cab. <laughs> There's a lesson to be learned. So well, you try here's to the thing. Does it. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I got nothing. I was told to go for it. Yeah, off, do it. I feel like I have to. Go right ahead. That's why I'm on the show. No, but when I first moved to New York, you know, uh, uh, Mike Ivey, black comic, he would, uh, I would have to get him a cab, and in return, you know, he promised not to steal from me. So it was a nice... Quid pro quo. Oh, it worked Christ. out. I, I, I think it's dangerous to profile any particular group. I really do. I think that's where we got in trouble with the, uh, the snipers, the D.C. snipers. They were riding around a car with shotguns in their hand, asking cops for directions. You know, hey, man, we're out of, <laughs> we're out of ammo. Where's the local gun shop? <laughs> so I just think it's dangerous to do that. So, you know, if you just... Go ahead, you got something. No, you know, the, the term racial profiling is thrown around all the time, and it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, what do you, you know, like you said at the opening, you know, you, there are certain kinds of groups that commit certain crimes. It's just a yeah. question of, you know, what, what are you outlawing exactly? Like, if you say, you know, most drug traffickers, most people that bring drugs into New York are black and Latino, which is a fact. Uh, but should you pull over every black and Latino? No, that would be wrong, and it would make pot really expensive in the city. <laughs> but, but common sense dictates, man. It's not, it's not just that you want to be racist. Um, you know, I don't want to see a guy stop because of his race. But when it comes to flying, if you have a thick mustache and a hyphen in your last name, I want you cavity searched. <laughs> It's common sense. There's nothing to do with being racist. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also it's that, that, that kind of, you know, the, the sort of politically correct way to, uh, to, you know, to claim we're not doing racial profiling at the airports is absurd. I mean, I, this, I was once flying back from Cincinnati bragging. And, you know, <laughs> Uh, Barry, you know Barry Williams is he's that the uh, he played Greg Brady, Greg Brady on, uh, yes. on the the Brady Bunch. Right. And he he they were searching him. They made him take his shoes off. He's sitting there. Greg Brady. You know, and, and he had just gotten his ass kicked on Celebrity Boxing the week before. It's like how much how much humiliation can this guy take? Uh, Greg Brady is not a terrorist. You know what I mean? Bobby Brady. He was always the troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> if ever there was like a metaphor for like the fall of the uh, middle class white America, it's him getting cut. Greg Brady getting searched. Yeah. That was no accident. It's the, dude, it's, it's the bomb. I mean, look, I don't dislike Arab guys, but that I wasn't going to go laugh on that, but you should have waited at least for a minute to see <laughs> Yeah, I didn't Stupid. mean... Shut up. It was out of respect. Head. I figured it was a little gap. Oh, I would go ahead. ahead. Sorry. But you have to look at what the impact 
I mean, I think we could all say honest things. We could say, look, there are certain groups that are responsible for certain kinds of crime, but the question is, what's the impact of, of profiling on the innocent members of that race? It's like right. no, nobody's, you know, stereotypes are true to an extent, but, you know, no, cops aren't pulling Chinese guys out of their cars and making them do math problems. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, Chinese guys aren't doing drive-by shootings. That's fine. I should let that one go. You <laughs> you know, thing. You kind of, what I see right now is like, okay, Colin, it, I've been racially profiled consistently. All right, all the time I get stopped. They 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 mess with me. You guys, that's, are, that's what we paid them for. That's what you, <laughs> you, I, white guys, man. You, you guys, at least every white guy I know, at least know one cop. Everyone. And then you have that card that they give you in case you're stopped. Card. Am I right? That, show this to the police in case you're stopped. As a black man, I don't have that. I don't have that. They stopped me all the time. They said one time they stopped me, and this is a true story. Said I had a drug dealer looking car. How the hell do you get your car to look like a drug dealer car? I see that cocaine shooting out the trunk of the car. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's hard. hard. And it is hard to see how tough it is. And he's one of the nice ones. No, he's so not. It's got, it's got to really... No, but listen. Yes. And let me tell you something else. But you have to admit, I've been arrested by black and white cops when I was a youth. And let me tell you something. The black cops love it when they get a white guy. They really loved it. You can just see that it changed their whole day for the better. There's a balance, dude. There's a balance, I think, between being... You said there's a balance due to the whole thing. <laughs> Call me, there's a balance, Mr. Quinn. All right, well, suede jacket wearing ass didn't seem appropriate. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, somehow it did. And yet, yeah. um, there's, there's a balance you find between, um, you know, between letting a ticking Arab onto an airplane and sodomizing a Haitian immigrant with a plunger. There's a place in the middle right, where you use common sense. Uh, Richard Reed, you can eyeball somebody and see what they're like. He couldn't have looked more like a shoe bomber if he had written shoe bomber on his face with a red marker. You look at him and you know there's something wrong with him. But, or you can enter. You know, the problem with the profiling at the airports is you're putting too much power in the hands of these mutants that run the airport security in the first place. You know what I mean, you just into, we all racially put, if, if I'm on an air, I fly all the time, if I'm on a flight and there's like a nervous looking Arab guy next to me, you know, you don't automatically assume just because he's Arab looking, but he's a little nervous, you start sizing him up, you know, how about those giants, dude, you know, how's the heck going, you know, yeah. you, you, uh, go USA, right? Well, let me tell you something else, too, and you know my family is half black at this point, <laughs> black, I've never met a, I've never met a black person that didn't drive over the speed limit, be honest. Drive over the speed limit? <laughs> be honest! The only thing I'll be honest with is that black guys, we so we have such a bad history with cops that when they stop us, we're so ready to play the race card, we actually forget we're doing illegal stuff. <laughs> what you stop me for? Because I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so look, the point is, if you see an Irish guy stumbling out of a bar today, St. Patrick's Day, just remember something. He was there for the pretzels. We'll be right back. Well, well, we're moving on. Six million kids are taking these behavioral meds every day, okay? And all these problems with drugs and medication now, it's kind of a... We had a similar scandal when I was a kid with Flintstones vitamins. No, that's not hacking. That's right. <laughs> they had to put me on two boys and a Mr. Slate. <laughs> then I was diagnosed with ADD. They were going to put me on St. Joseph's uh, Asperger for Children, but my mother said it was a violation of church and state. Uh, <laughs> come on, that was a sophisticated one. Um, let's talk about this thing because ADD, it is an important subject, and if there's one group of people that have ADD, it's comedians. Right. Do you think kids should be... Uh, you know, you guys were born with ADD, do you realize that? And depression, actually. They were actually going to put me, um, I don't know if I have ADD, but this is true. When I was a kid, they were going to put me on uh, Ritalin or some sort of drug, uh, but they didn't. And I don't think you should put your kids on drugs unless there's something really wrong with them. I turned out okay. I mean, you know, yeah, I was going to say you're quite, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I want your kids to be a, you know, a who pays from black hookers to tinkle on them, then don't put them on any drugs. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. Like, we're getting back to profiling with that one. I mean, uh, you know, Ritalin, Ritalin's an amphetamine. Well, you the same color. <laughs> Go ahead. The Rid Ritalin's uh, it's an amphetamine. You're giving little children amphetamines. I mean, it's, you know, these teachers, you know, maybe it's the teachers. Tell you, I'm sick of hearing about it. The teachers keep complaining they don't get paid enough. They're, you know, crank out some kids that could read, then we'll renegotiate. You know what I mean? <laughs> maybe it's the teacher's fault. It's all about the kids. The kids have short attention spans. Now, how you know? You're talking about young kids, four or five right, year old right. kids. It's not like they're they're influenced by that much societal stuff at that age. You know, it's like kids. Maybe most of these people aren't worth listening to for more than ten or fifteen seconds. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they talk about the the symptoms of ADHD, I guess it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like that's every kid. 
if your kid don't have those symptoms, he's probably retarded. So it was right, right. <laughs> That's the other point. Oh, it's the yeah. parents. And let me just what the, what's that? It's the parents. It's not the teacher. It's it's bad parenting, and that's why kids aren't paying attention. They're little spoiled douches because people want the. Uh, they are. They're awful. Parents want the uh, two cars in the garage, and the women want the careers. It's like if you want the career, fine. Stop having kids. Turn over on your stomach and give up the balloon knot once in a while. <laughs> Do <laughs> uh, you realize with the ADHD, yeah. what, one thing that you, you uh, I found out is that these kids, when, when you, if you, your kid is diagnosed with having ADHD, it, you, know, you get a check for that. You get money, oh. like 700 a month. I mean, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's tempting. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. He knows all about all the social programs. I don't know that. He knows that. You realize what's going to happen now? Everybody's going to be watching each other and they're going to start trying to get us. Yeah, that's yeah. it. First of all, let me say a couple of things. One is, my mother, my father, my sisters, all my cousins, they're all teachers. I don't appreciate your attitude. <laughs> second of all, oh, second of all, really, who is, don't you guys feel like you would have been something a little more successful? No. If you'd been, I was shut up. If you were, don't you know you were like the crazy kids in class? Like I was always back there with the bully and the other idiot in the back, you know? Yeah. And we were the class clown. What, when, class clown, bully, whatever. That was what I, well. That's seat, what you right wanted to finish. Yeah. I had, I, when I was in grammar school, you know, I went to a high school that was like a sort of a progressive kind of high school, and then my whole life turned around. It was very disciplined. That's, yeah, but no, I wasn't disciplined. It was, it was just more progressive and open-minded, and they treated people with respect. When I was in grammar school, I went to Catholic grammar schools in Queens, and my parents would get called in all the time. Time and it seems there's something wrong at home, what's right. happening at right. home. You know, it's like, well, maybe I prefer staring out the window than listening to this moron speak. Right. Well, maybe that was the problem. I, I think we have teachers bad. again, Greg, damn it. That's <laughs> it. I already told you. And they, a couple of them taught Catholic school, too. The matter I do as a student. Cut the teacher's pay had, and put that money in a pool damn it. To, to pay the pro athletes. I had, <laughs> seriously, anybody, anybody can sit in a classroom full of kids and not teach them anything, but it's only a tiny percentage of college date rapists that get to go on and become professional athletes. So I had, I'm sorry. They deserve... They deserve to be compensated. He's got a good point. Now, I, I, what about the Canadian school system? Right. Why are people so boring when they come out of there? I don't know. When it's I was little... younger, I wasn't on any kind of... I self-medicated. You know, you started in early yeah. age, and that's what you do. Well, is that a Canadian thing? Is well, not, not, uh, drugs, are not, yeah. drugs are not the answer. Uh, dr drugs are not the answer because you're going you're gonna to stifle creativity. Uh, they thought I had... This is true. They thought I had... I used to have a nervous twitch where I would stand... You I'm too! Sure. Oh, All right. Dude... <laughs> 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 Self awareness. I get a lot of things to do. <laughs> Look at the kid and tell him you love him. Unless you have a good prescription plan, then uh, grind pills in a breakfast is a little sociopath that gets out on his own. <laughs> we'll be right back. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. During his fireside chats throughout World War II, President Roosevelt asked Americans to make sacrifices, tangible things they could do with well, a on the home front, while well, the husbands, the sons, and the brothers fought overseas. United against a common enemy, American civilians uh, bought war bonds, rationed food, and held blackout drills. And most importantly, they let you know who the enemy was. Okay? This is a replica of a real poster. See? You got the white lady with a little child here, about to be groped by the enemy. Japanese guy's going for the nipple. <laughs> German guy's going to pull out the barrette, you know? And you're like, damn, yeah. Get you a hot ball. You're like, okay, well, who do I send a check to, you know? Of course, if we made that poster today, you'd have to add a thousand hands so it couldn't be accused of being racially profiling of Islamics. You know, just have to be everybody kind of a politically correct thing, you know. You got the black dude, you got the uh, white, white uh, trash guy over there. And, uh, the Puerto Rican putting the earring on the baby, that's a nice touch, I think. And, uh, you got the lesbian going after the mother, I don't know. Whatever that is, uh, uh, a casino chip or sushi, I don't know what the hell it is. And too you can't invest directly in the war. I'd like to buy shares of a surface-to-air missile. Instead of getting depressed about my 401k, I could turn to a military briefing on CNN and track my investments, you know? Hey, look, my missile goes up, a building goes down, capital gain, you know? I'll take Lockheed over Enron any day. What happened to the good old days of the government rallied the home front with racial slurs? This is a real poster from World War II. <laughs> look at this. Look at this. Uncle Slam rolls up his sleeves. He's going to beat the Japanese guy to death with a tire iron. You know? <laughs> you couldn't get away with that now. It's too bad. Monosyllabic ethnic slurs like Jap, Kraut, and Wop helped Americans get behind the war. Now we don't even have the balls to dehumanize the enemy. We call Saddam, 
by his first name like he's our ex-frat buddy. You know? <laughs> and we call the terrorists a few bad apples who hijacked Islam. You know? How are we supposed to kill an enemy that our government is afraid to offend? Well, so, like President Roosevelt, I ask you, my fellow Americans, to join me in making a few sacrifices for this war effort. Number one, <laughs> we start rationing food. Not all food, just carbs. As of today, America, we're all on the Atkins diet. <laughs> Listen, when the troops left for the Gulf, we were a bunch of fat pigs suing McDonald's for serving us french fries. Enough. Our troops are laying their lives on the line for us. Let's show them some gratitude. Give them a homecoming parade of sick pack abs and sweet tight asses. Now. All right. Now. Number two. It's time to call out the gas guzzling SUV drivers. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the soccer moms. I'll take care of them. I'm talking about the hip hoppers. I'm asking a few hearty souls to go to do or die bed style tonight and make the ultimate sacrifice for your country. Approach an idling Range Rover, knock out the blacked out window, and when it slowly opens to reveal the barrel of a Tech 9, demand that 50 cents start carpooling with DMX. <laughs> All right. Number three. Tonight we're going to get real specific and real clear for the war effort. We've got a tough crowd care package that's going out to the troops in the Kuwaiti desert tomorrow. We asked the audience to donate some things to the troops. A lot of you guys brought very nice stuff. Let's see what they brought us, okay? These are just some of the items. A lot of people, you know, we really appreciate it. Well, first we got this guy. He sent uh, gum and vitamin C for the troops right here. Which is, no, this is the kind of stuff they actually asked for. And I guess uh, this is probably, uh, this, the American troops asked for this, but not for themselves, for the English troops. Seriously. They, um, you know, the teeth. They don't have uh, a big dental plan over there. Um, that was from Alan Wagner of the Bronx, New York. And uh, thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. <laughs> He's like, hey, you know. Well, all you guys brought stuff. Easy Al Wagner. Uh, now you got uh, Anise Gemmel from New York City. She, uh, her hometown is Anchorage, Alaska. I don't know what that means, but something about it is freaky, isn't it? She sent a, a kosher salami from Katz's Deli. Anise, I know you meant well, but let's face the facts. Why don't you just get the guy, you understand the scent that gets picked up of a kosher thing in the Middle East? <laughs> why don't you just, why don't you send the guy a yarmulke with a target on top? All right, look. No. I'm just kidding. And this could also come in handy. Don't ask, don't tell. All right, look. All right. Damn it. I had to go for it. I couldn't resist it. Don't ask, don't tell. The, um, then you got David Haverhouse, Matt Holly, and Clayton Zistra of Seattle, Washington. They sent the game Risk, which is a game about war, you know, how to be like a world domination power. Now, either they're the most insensitive kids that ever lived, or they're the most ironic kids that ever lived, or because they're Seattle, sometimes you think they're trying to make a statement. <laughs> no. You know, Seattle, they like to make statements up there a lot. Um, well, folks, thank you very much. We're going to send all this stuff out. You guys put a lot of other stuff in there. Very nice. And uh, I'll be keeping the porno. But other than that, they'll get everything. God bless you, and God bless America. We'll see you for Act 4. Thank you. Well, comedians have often helped soldiers get through a war. World War II, you had Bob Hope. The Korean War, you had uh, Bob Hope. And then Vietnam was Bob Hope. And uh, the Gulf War was Jay Leno and Bob Hope. And uh, the next war has these people. <laughs> we asked each member of our panel to record a message for the troops. Okay, first up, Greg. Fellas, I'd like to give you a little advice. Stay positive. Remember, you're not alone. You're part of a vast international coalition. The world is with us on this, okay? Bulgaria sending a couple of dudes. That's pretty much it. Listen, I really hope you all get home safe. It's sad that war still exists, but let's face it. We live in a backwards, unjust, and evil world where people fly planes into office buildings and Robin Williams wins a Grammy for best comedy album. Look, it's scary. Good luck to everybody. Okay, Keith. All right. To all my brothers over there in the desert, I want you to know I'm with you in spirit. And when you get into Baghdad, there's a place, a club called 72 Virgins. <laughs> it's on the corner of MLK Boulevard and Saddam Parkway, <laughs> next to the KFC. <laughs> I know a guy at the door. Champagne room is on me. Y'all take care. See you. All right. Jim. Jim Norton. 
Uh, you guys, you're doing the right thing over there, and you shouldn't care if the rest of the world criticizes you any more than Lara Flynn Boyle cares if she's criticized by a fat chick. <laughs> and while you're taking care of business, please feel free to open the cargo doors and drop a few megatons on those ungrateful, uncircumcised monkeys in France, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and South Korea. All right. Okay. All right. Ba Bonnie McFarlane. Well, my heart goes out to all the troops who are so far away from their friends, family, and lovers. But as a female, I really feel like I should address, more specifically, the woman warriors who so often get ignored by the media. You're bona fide soldiers, but under those flak jackets and Rosie O'Donnell haircuts, you're still ladies who get scared and lonely and need something to keep you going. Yeah! <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's the show nice. for the troops. If you get my tape, fast forward right to Bonnie.